to begin, we need to distinguish two ideas that are often muddled, often confused. The first is the idea of merit in the sense of competence. That's a good thing. The second is meritocracy. That's a problem. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. If I'm flying in an airplane, I want a well-qualified pilot in the cockpit. Aligning people's skills with the jobs that, and social roles they perform, that's, that's a good thing on sensible, practical grounds. But that's not meritocracy. Meritocracy is something different. Meritocracy is an ethic of earning and deserving. It's a system of rule based on deservingness. By a system of rule, I mean a way of allocating income and wealth, power, honor, esteem. The meritocratic ideal can be summed up in a simple proposition. If chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Notice, this is a moral claim. It goes well beyond the practical proposition that it's a good thing to have well-qualified surgeons and airline pilots. Now, this is really the heart, the moral argument, is really the heart of the case for meritocracy, if one can be made. And it arises typically in the following way, by asking the question, what was wrong with a feudal aristocracy, a hereditary aristocracy, or a class-based society? And there are two answers to this question. The first is a practical objection. Hereditary aristocracies were inefficient because those who landed on top may well have been incompetent. Meanwhile, there were many gifted, talented people, serfs, peasants, harvesting potatoes. That's the practical objection, the objection of inefficiency. But the second objection to a class-based society or an arist hereditary aristocracy is the moral objection. It's unfair. Why is it unfair? Because people's life prospects are determined in a hereditary aristocracy by the accident of birth. And when that's the case, it can't really be said that those who land on top deserve their place. They don't deserve their place because it's not their doing, they haven't earned it, they've lucked into it. So that's what's wrong with a feudal or hereditary aristocracy. Meritocracy seems to offer a solution to this problem. If careers are open to talents, and if everyone has an equal chance to develop their talents, then it can be said, so the meritocrat argues that the winners deserve their winnings. But can it be said that the winners in a meritocracy deserve their winnings? No, not really, for two reasons. First is to do with differences in upbringing, family background. The second is to do with talents. Even if everyone can attend a good school, even if everyone is free to take university entrance exams, still it's the case that those from supportive families are likely to do better. And we see this today in most in American universities. Most of the students at selective colleges and universities in the United States are from affluent families, very few from poor backgrounds. You look at the 100 or so most competitive universities in the United States, more than 70% of those who attend come from the top quarter of the income scale. How many from the bottom quarter? 
3%. If you look at the most prestigious places, the Ivy League and Stanford and such places, there are more students from the top 1% than from families in the bottom half of the country combined. Put it another way, if you come from a rich family in the top 1%, your chances of attending an Ivy League school are 77 times greater than if you come from a poor family. And this is despite generous financial aid to those from poor backgrounds. So uh, this is one problem. Now you might say, well, the solution to this problem is simply more meritocracy improve educational opportunity for low-income students so they can compete on a level playing field. Yes, by all means, we should do that. But, that, but suppose that we could. Suppose that we could somehow counteract, it's unlikely, counteract all of the advantages of family background in meritocratic competition. Then what? Then, hypothetically, whoever did best on objective tests, standardized tests, aptitude tests, like the American SAT, they would win admission. But uh, because those tests would then truly measure talent, IQ, intellectual promise, but that raises a further question. Because remember, we're talking about moral deservingness. Why do the talented, the gifted, as defined even by the best IQ test you could imagine, why did they deserve the winnings that, that would flow to them in a meritocratic, uh, competitive society? Is their having an IQ a high IQ, or is their ability to do well on standardized tests, is that their doing, or is that their good fortune? There are two contingencies to do with the way talents could be rewarded. First, having this or that talent is not one's own doing. Think of a great athlete like Ronaldo or Lionel Messi or Wayne Rooney. Having the talent, great athletic talent, that's a gift. Second, the fact that these great footballers live in a society that loves football, that's not their doing. That, too, is their good luck. Had Ronaldo lived back in the days of the Renaissance, they didn't care much about football. They were more interested in fresco painting. So these are two elements of moral contingency that undermine the idea that the, the talented, if we could identify them somehow uh, without any class bias, that the talented deserve all the benefits that flow from the exercise of their talent. So here's the question. It's a question for Adrian. A question for any defender of meritocracy. What is the difference morally between the accident of birth of being born to a well-off family or in the upper class, and the accident of birth involved in being born gifted or with the talents society happens to prize. If someone happens to be born with a high IQ, are they any more deserving than someone who happens to be born into the upper class? That's the question for Adrian, and I'm eager to hear what he has to say.